In a rapidly changing world, we are moving fast to support countries with their efforts to grow and innovate in ways that protect the future. Over the last five years, the World Bank Group has delivered over $83 billion in climate finance for developing countries, adding 48 gigawatts of renewable energy to help communities, businesses, and economies thrive. But we all need to do more together. We all need to innovate for climate, bringing together policy, technology, markets, and finance to accelerate investments in climate-smart solutions and shape a resilient and people-centered recovery from the pandemic by facilitating a global exchange of knowledge, showcasing tried and tested solutions and mobilizing investments. Welcome to the World Bank Group's Innovate for Climate Conference. Three days focusing on how to. How can countries and businesses step up on climate change? How can good policies and practices support a just transition to net zero? And how can climate smart investments create jobs for the future? The World Bank Group is setting ambitious climate targets. Join us as we turn commitments into action. Share ideas and innovations that are proven to work at scale. Because being bold on climate is also good for development. Together, we can shape a greener, more inclusive and resilient world. Welcome to Innovate for Climate 2021. Hello and welcome to Innovate for Climate 2021. I am delighted to be hosting this flagship climate action event here from London. Now that powerful video that you've just seen demonstrates not only some remarkable achievements, but also the scale of what still needs to be done. While countries continue to struggle with the pandemic, the climate crisis continues unabated. Solutions are needed today and in all countries so that people and communities are able to recover and thrive. Now we've seen a lot of progress over the years, but this is the moment to leverage innovation as we rebuild and transform our economies to be greener, more resilient and inclusive. Over the next three days, Innovate for Climate will be showcasing the most promising low carbon, resilient innovations and policies that are working for developing countries and fostering an exchange of knowledge, which will hopefully promote investment in climate smart solutions. Now in its fifth year, this is Innovate for Climate's first virtual event, broadcasting to a global audience in several time zones, and our audience today is larger than ever before. Over the next three days, we are going to bring together powerful voices in the plenaries, practical workshops, an inspiring marketplace, as well as giving you opportunities for networking and sharing ideas. Now, there are plenty of workshops to choose from, so please do make sure you check out the agenda and do drop into the marketplace, where you will be able to connect with inspiring climate action innovators and discover their inspirational plans. We invite you to tag us on social media using the hashtag InnovateForClimate. If you do have any queries during this event, you can contact the help desk support team using the live chat function. Now, I'm really looking forward to being your host throughout the next three days as we hear from accomplished leaders and panelists from around the world and develop new perspectives on a climate smart future. This, of course, would not have been possible without the support of our partners and sponsors. We are especially grateful to the governments of Germany and Spain and to all of you who've contributed your time and energy to create amazing content. Thank you so much. And let me remind you, all of the sessions that you see throughout the conference will be available on demand for the next 90 days. So now, to begin proceedings, it is my very great pleasure to introduce World Bank Group President David Malpass to open Innovate for Climate and discuss systemic climate solutions at scale with Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock. David, it's over to you. Thank you, Anita. Welcome everybody to Innovate for Climate. Over the next three days, we'll bring together representatives from the public and private sectors across the worlds of finance, markets, 
policy and technology to showcase opportunities to exchange knowledge and to drive action with tangible results. Our collective responses to climate change, poverty and inequality are defining choices of our age. The World Bank Group is the largest multilateral provider of climate finance for developing countries, and we've increased financing to record levels over the past two years. Over the next five years, our plan calls for major new increases in ways that have as much results as possible in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to climate in ways that save lives and livelihoods. We're working with countries to integrate climate and development agendas and formulate well-planned carbon reduction strategies. To succeed on climate, our plan recognizes the need for meaningful climate impact as a core part of sustainable development. These must be addressed together, especially in the developing world. This reality presents a set of complex challenges in terms of the financing of global public goods, setting economic incentives, and measurement. These are all key parts of our climate change action plan. Two specific challenges bear mentioning. Historically, most of the world's man-made greenhouse gas emissions have come from advanced economies, but emissions from China, India, and a small group of developing countries have grown rapidly with their coal usage. This creates a specific challenge for development in terms of the transition away from coal to lower carbon fuels. At the other extreme, a large group of developing countries produces only a small portion of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, yet feels the impact of climate change. These countries include fragile and conflict states, low-income countries, and small island developing states. It's a group that suffers from droughts, floods, and risks to coastal livelihoods. The Ida countries, that's 75 of the world's poorest countries, produce only 4% of the greenhouse gases, meaning the vital development step is to adapt to climate change. My ask to all of you watching and listening is to engage in these difficult but vital conversations. First, is development policy factoring in those distinctions a small group of large emitters needing mitigation strategies, along with a large group that needs adaptation strategies. The World Bank's Climate Change Action Plan is built on this country differentiation. Second, for the large emitters that are poor, how does the world help reduce coal usage and carbon emissions? Should the costs of this type of glo global public good be shared worldwide, and if so, how? Third, how should economic incentives change to align with climate goals? For example, using carbon taxes and reducing fossil fuel subsidies. And how can these resources be used most effectively? For example, to help people transition to greener fuels and jobs or reduce other tax burdens. Fourth, can an effective carbon credit market be created that allows greenhouse gas emissions for some while paying for reductions elsewhere? Not just certificates of notional carbon reduction, but actual measurable and sustainable decarbonization. Can standards be established in these markets that properly measure the full life cycle costs and benefits of various climate policy choices? And lastly, what are the best ways to finance the necessary preparedness for future pandemics and natural disasters, knowing that preparation is often the more cost effective than after the fact disaster relief? Hello, I'm delighted to kick off our Innovate for Climate conference with a conversation with Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. Uh, we're going to discuss how the public and private sectors 
can work together to address the challenges of climate change. So Larry, welcome and thank you for, uh, for, for joining and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, but you, one of the big challenges we're facing at the World Bank is the recognition that it's going to take a lot of funding to really make an impact on, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, also on adaptation. How do you see the role of the private sector? Is it, is it, is it feasible? Can we do it and what should be that role? Well, David, welcome. Good to see you. Uh, looks like you're healthy, and hopefully everybody at the World Bank uh, is, is acting safely and, and in, a, in a good health. Uh, I know it's a, uh, for many parts of the world, it's a very difficult period of time, especially in parts of the world like uh, Brazil and India. So uh, our, our employees at BlackRock are being impacted, and I'm sure the World Bank's clients and employees are being impacted, too. Um, so related to the um, private sector engagement uh, in terms of climate change, I don't think we are going to be able to do this alone by just the public sector. Uh, the costs are enormous. The needs are enormous. And it's going to have to be done with a combination of public and private. But the most important element in getting this done is long-term planning by governments and companies. Um, you know, we, we are talking about trying to get to a net zero world in 30 years. Um, it took 40 years to bring down the cost of solar and wind. So there's no green premium. 40 years on that one technology. And so we can adapt many of our power generation through solar and wind in many parts of the, the world. But until we have obviously better battery, battery storage technology, it's not going to be, we can't be fully dependent on, on those types of intermittent sources of energy. But the reality is where, 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 the, where the true transformation is going to be occurring is going to be through innovation, like what solar and wind did, but innovation for you know, things like green hydrogen, innovation for, for sequestering carbon, innovation for a green cement and green steel. Uh, and then more, just as importantly, 14% of, of the world's carbon footprint is through agriculture. And so you add all this up, this cannot be done solely by a proclamation by a government. And importantly, too, as we all know, this is going to have to be done in the totality of the world. This is gonna be one of the real tests. Can the world cooperate together? Can we move forward together? Uh, David, I am certain that the private sector at this moment is moving faster than the public sector. I actually believe public companies are moving very rapidly towards this. Uh, and it's gonna be a long transition, so let's be clear. But I think you know what, what we are seeing, um, we are seeing a transformation in attitudes by business leaders and their leadership and their boards. Um, our dialogues with clients worldwide have been transformed over the last three years. And this is why I've written about a tectonic shift in finance. And why I think this is so dramatically changed is I do believe finance has opened their eyes to the impact of climate change. I mean, even read recently about the EPA now saying that the physical impact of climate change is more severe than we otherwise thought. Um, but, but it's clear in my dialogues, my conversations in every continent in the world with business leaders, with policymakers, with regulators, they are all asking the question. And now we are starting to see a real shift in investment attitude. And the role of the asset manager is a really significant role because we're at the nexus between the owners of capital, we don't own any of the money, and the companies that we invest in. And so our role is to be educating the asset owners that there's choice today, choice away from traditional indexes or liabilities that, are, that have uh, attributes that are gonna be more sustainable and then obviously we have to be working with companies that, you know, depending on what industry they're in or what companies specifically, how they're moving forward. But I am very excited um, and confident that we are seeing, we're seeing very fast movement, even faster movement than I ever dreamed of in terms of the capital markets understanding this and moving forward. Uh, obviously, let's be clear, there are a lot of naysayers. We, they're 
publications that repeatedly write about this is this is merchandising or greenwashing or whatever they say. I, I truly don't believe that's the case at all. And I believe it's actually for the first time in my 40 odd years, you, 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 we're seeing the tectonic uh, change in attitude. And the attitude is is rapidly evolving into asset allocation, asset reallocation. Uh, and so this is um, very important, but we're not going to get there. We're not going to get there unless we have disclosure by all companies in terms of understanding how they're moving forward, especially in the decarbonization of the world. We are not going to get there unless we have a global standard, which we don't have. We don't have the Europeans saying the same thing as the U.S. We're not. We're, we're we are just beginning the dialogues in parts of Asia and other parts of the world. Um, but until we have better definitions of how we are moving forward, this is going to be very difficult to really get this in a unified way. And I hope out of the COP26 that we are all going to be a part of it in in uh, in November in Glasgow that the policymakers, the regulators come together, hopefully with the private sector, in trying to move forward on a global taxonomy that we could all work for. Now, I think the most pivotal thing that I think is going to impact the world, and this is one thing that I've been privately talking to many policymakers, um, if we're going to only ask public companies to move forward and to do this through these standards, we're not going to get to a net zero. We're, we're truly not being faithful to the, to the net zero objective of, of the Paris Accord. If we're going to be faithful, not just through you know, headlines, but faithful, faithful in terms of execution, all of society has to be a part of this. I am fearful right now that all the pressure is going to be on public companies, and public companies are going to move forward. But we're not going to get to a net zero if we don't ask all society moving forward. And what I'm particularly frightened of, and we're seeing such evidence of this, we're seeing many public companies divest of some of their hydrocarbons. And they look better. They look better to me as an investor in those companies. But if, you're, but if you put your, your hat on representing the world, and if you were representing the whole concept of a net zero world, if, if somebody sells part of their business, which is the dirtiest of the hydrocarbons, and they sell it to another entity that's private, that company looks well, but the world doesn't change. The net zero world doesn't change. And so what, I'm, what I urge everybody on is we need to be unified. And this has to be, if we really are serious about a net zero world, not just through words, but through action, it has to be a unified objective of the world, but all of society within each country. Right. And, and, and so those, those are big challenges. You went through quite a few things. So I, I had thoughts as you, as you were, uh, as you were explaining, um, you, one of the things that we're trying to do at the world bank and we are doing is to, to improve diagnostics so that there is some, uh, quantification of, of, uh, uh, of what the goals are and what uh, progress is being made. So that's very important. And then we're working with countries to, uh, to see that they're nationally determined contributions, the NDCs that are part of the Paris Agreement, uh, have some, some, some connection to their development plans and are somewhat achievable uh, and can be financed. Because as we think about it, getting to that some, some kind of uh, uh, results orientation within countries' development plans is going to be critical. It's especially important for poorer countries uh, because they don't have the funding to, to do things that that uh, to to really participate maybe in global public goods. So that whole system, I think, uh, needs to be uh, based on diagnostics that give some sense. And your your example is very good. If you sell a part of your business that's a high high carbon part of the business to someone else, what has the world gained? And so I think we need to find ways that the diagnostics do that also with NDCs uh, with. You know, if, if a country reduces it, we can take this to the national level. If a country reduces what it's doing in terms of high carbon emissions, but some other country simply picks that up and, and is competitive and profitable, uh, then 
again, what have you what have you gained? So I think right. that's one big challenge for the world to get coherence of NDCs uh, within the context of actual results uh, toward green, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but I, I want to come to another point that you raised, which I think is very important, is the, the one of standards. How, as you think about it, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. The World Bank Group, uh, w so we issue $100 billion uh, per year of bonds, and they're labeled sustainable development bonds. As you look at what qualifies them as sustainable development bonds, it's because of what the World Bank does around the world in terms of development. But uh, the standards are still emerging of how do you define that? We have a subset within our bond issuance that are called green bonds, and so they're, they're yeah. one portion of that overall portfolio. Uh, and so one of the things I, I think the world is struggling with is what qualifies uh, for, for the standards that are needed to actually get toward the, the ultimate goal of, uh, let's say, net zero or, or of greenhouse gas reduction as a starting point. What, what are, who's going to be the standard setter, do you think, and where would you like that to reside? In my letters over the last two years, I've been urging companies to report under TCFD and SASB. Uh, and we're claiming that they're not perfect, but they are standards that we can live in. But hopefully we, the world could come together with it. You know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 IF, the IR, IFR uh, standards. Um, um, as I said, we need to all come together in finding the proper taxonomy. Um, and our principles in accounting are so different in the United States versus the principles in Europe. And so there lies a fundamental issue in itself. Um, SASB, we believe, is a very good model, but there are many companies within Europe who object to SASB at this time because SASB also has a lot of social elements that, and, but, you know, we're, you know, we are not going to be the creator of a standard. We will participate. And this is probably one of the more vital issues that the COP26 is going to have to uh, address. Uh, we need to have a taxonomy that we can all agree upon, that we can all work together. And quite frankly, we are not, uh, we're not, um, we have a voice, but we're not going to, um, we're going to accept whatever standards that regulators and governments accept upon, but it's going to be difficult if they don't come together. At the same time, David, we as a firm, though, are spending huge sums of time and money and talent on creating analytics to, for us to better judge the physical impact of climate change let's say even the United States on mortgage backed securities and commercial real estate. So we have, we have imported now um, satellite imaging with models that adjust climate change and the impact on, on water tables and what it means for heat and the impact of heat and flooding and thunderstorms. And uh, we imported that onto our, analytical system now that we can actually see what area is going to be impacted. What does that mean for a physical impact, even on municipal bonds now? What does it mean for a specific city or municipality? So we're going to be, we're able to do that and we're able to see that on a global scale in terms of what, what that does. We are actually spending a great deal of time on analytics and modeling to see on how, how we move towards a decarbonized world and the impact of companies. And so we're, we're trying to, import a lot of information onto our system so we can quantify why we believe climate risk is investment risk. And what we're trying to do, we're, we're going to be more successful in that if we have a global taxonomy too, to judge every company and judge everything together. Uh, but we're, we're, we are moving very rapidly as an organization so we can have the analytics and data so we could make sure that when we invest on behalf of our clients' money as a fiduciary, you know, we're, we're, you know the more important thing that I, I should say, we're doing this not as an environmentalist. We're doing this as a capitalist. Our, our objective, especially for our clients' money who we manage in the United States under the ERISA laws, 
uh, from the Department of Labor is we have to maximize return. That is the only f objective that we can do. Now, in Europe, they have different objectives. But in the United States, the objective of the law is to maximize return. And it was fortified under the Trump administration that that you have to really be ensured that you're maximizing return. And you can't look at social or environmental issues unless you believe they are impacting. And this is one of the reasons why we came out with a whole statement about why we believe climate risk is investment risk. And we're building the analytics and data to show our clients and to quantify why we believe that's the case. Uh, and, and we're not doing this because, you know, you know we're wokeish or an environmentalist. We're doing this because we truly believe Many assets that we invest in are at risk, and many parts of the world are going to be at risk. Many companies are going to be at risk if we don't move forward. In, in, in addition to, to the risk assessment, uh, there's also the, the, the total return over, over time. And that one of the key things, or a, a, a part of that, is the, is the incentive structure that different countries set up. So we know that uh, some countries tax gasoline and diesel fuel more than other countries, for example. Yeah. So that creates yeah. a difference in the investment climate in those. Some countries uh, subsidize fossil fuels uh, heavily and, and to varying degrees and in varying ways. So I think I, in addition to the, your, your, your point is good on the standards between, let's say, Europe and the U.S., but really it's a global challenge of what the standards are. I think there's also this uh, uh, challenge of uh, uh, the incentive structures being different in different countries. In fact, dramatically different. And that that then leads to a, a, another challenge, which is the cross-border adjustments that some are talking about. And I think it's important that those not become protectionist in the in the way that they they operate. You don't want to simply block someone else's product. But on the other hand, what if it's a product that's used with a particularly carbon intensive kind of manufacturing process? So these become right. Uh, it's a little bit separate from the standards, uh, regulatory standards and so on. It's the actual core of the incentive structure for countries. If they, if they, uh, you, you know, in the, in the U.S., you, we can wonder the gasoline taxes are not are not high. Now, this particular time, point in time, the gasoline prices are already high, so you wouldn't want to. You you might not want to add a gasoline tax at this point, but if prices were lower, that might be a timing structure to change the incentive. So what the World Bank, one thing we are doing is evaluating in countries which ones subsidize uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, certain kinds of goods in a way that that's not really supportive of development. It's just supportive of one industry and where that can be pointed out, then the countries can adjust their subsidy structures in a way that's beneficial to both development and also to climate. That might be lowering their their uh, their uh, subsidies for for uh, fossil fuel production, for example. Uh, and so I think that's that's one area where there can be a win-win uh, that that's both uh, profitable, uh, that makes sense from the standpoint of climate, and makes sense for development. Do, uh, so I'll I'll lay that out. That's a, that seems like a clear one. People countries have trouble making progress on it. Do you see? Are there other? Some people have written about nuclear uh, electricity production as one area where it's win-win in that it's uh, it's uh, very low carbon emission uh, and and uh, uh, might become cost effective if there was enough volume. Do you see areas where there's opportunities for the world that are in the nature of win-win? Well, the, we're going to get to a win-win when when we have innovation and technology uh, that brings down the green premium. Um, the one thing we are not going to get to a net zero, and, and I'm sure the World Bank really understands this really well, we're not going to get to a net zero world unless we could offer all the world an alternative to hydrocarbons or to a carbon created technology. Um, unless it costs, the relative costs are similar to what hydrocarbon costs are. Hydrocarbon costs are, in many cases, is cheaper than water. So it's a very difficult task. 
And this is why we are certain and why we believe it's so imperative that there's, a, there's huge sums of capital going into innovation. And I actually believe the next 100 unicorns may be in the, in the area of in, in the decarbonization process. And we're going to create new technologies, new engines, new opportunities, uh, way beyond solar uh, and wind. Um, and when you think about if we are really going to get the emerging world to, to fully be capable of moving rapidly towards a net zero footprint, it's going to have to be done at a cost effective basis. And even in, in, with the uh, bountiful wealth of the United States, we're not going to, we're not going to move quick enough unless our transition is just throughout all the communities too. And the areas that are of, of all countries that are heavily dependent on jobs and uh, livelihood that are carbon intensive today, how do we navigate that? That gets back to readjustments. And so if we do raise a carbon tax, how do we redistribute that to help the communities that are that are moving i mean one one of my criticisms about carbon tax has been not the not that it's a regressive which it certainly is but carbon in most countries today carbon tax are used for balancing their budgets if we're going to if we're going to raise a carbon tax to a higher level in the united states today we need to make sure that it's being done obviously to create new green uh, to reduce the green premium, but two, but also helping in that adjustment in the societies or the communities that are being being harmed. And I think this is going to be a really big issue in all countries about how do we make that adjustment. Now, the positive side, let's even take Texas in the United States. There are more uh, green energy jobs in Texas than there are in hydrocarbon jobs today because, as we, you know, Texas has a huge solar and wind footprint. Obviously, it's not connected to the rest of the country. And so we saw what happens when you had that, that cold snap in Texas. And it, it, was, it, it is not as resilient as it should be. But on the other hand, um, we, you know, over with, and this is why I got back to we need government to do long term planning. That's the only way we're going to get it. And if we don't do the long-term planning in time and, and trying to respond to the adjustments, to try to making sure that it's a just transition, we're not going to get to that point. And importantly, if we are going to get countries like India and other really highly populated countries that are going to be severely impacted by climate change, I mean, the equatorial part of the world, all the science says that the rising heat is going to be quite destructive for crops, you know, Rising temperatures actually adjust the time when pollinators come to crops. And I mean, it really changes the entire, you know, if you read the science about what this does, it really magnifies what goes on. We saw in Africa what climate change has done. It related to um, uh, locusts and how that changes and how it changes crops. So let's be clear, this is going to be a very difficult task. But I'm optimistic, and I'm, I, you know, I just painted a pretty negative picture. But I'm truly optimistic that if we invest, if we as a world invest, we invest our, 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 our into these new technologies, we could create a just transition. And so, as an as a as an investor, as a capitalist, I'm actually very excited about raising capital into investing in these new technologies so we could bring down the green premium and that all parts of the world can participate in this in this green horizon and we could get to a net zero world those are very interesting points uh, you're raising one you, you know world bank working on a just transition for the poorer countries uh part of that is the new capital that needs to come in in order to help uh fund that it's also the the actual jobs that are in it you know one of the one of the immediate challenges for certain of the developing countries is uh transitioning people from coal mining and from the 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 coal industry itself 
uh, into into uh, other activities, other skills. That's that's some job retraining, which uh, World Bank has has some skills in. So we're working from that side of it, recognizing that it costs a lot of money, uh, but it's and and it's also a social activity within the countries of how do you get that change uh, moving. That that includes in in India, but uh, in South Africa and in other uh, developing countries. Um, and I'm glad you also that you raised uh, that the uh, you know there's a inherent uh, inequality or unfairness in the system the of the of the Ida countries the 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 75 poorest countries in the world they produce just four percent of the greenhouse gas emissions but they get the impact like everyone of climate changes that are underway and so one of the challenges for the finance community is giant amounts of money need to be uh, invested in adaptation for for people, meaning moving people away from coastal areas, for example. Uh, and yet from an investment standpoint, that's a hard one to find where the profit comes from. So putting that together is one of the one of the big challenges. We, World Bank's committed to having a full 50% or more of our climate financing in adaptation, not not mitigation, which is the more clear uh, the more clear uh, goal and one that people can see private markets uh, operating in to transition from high carbon fuels to lower carbon fuels, for example. You can imagine there being profitable investments in that side, but then. This uh, big challenge is uh, is motivating investment, mobilizing private capital into the adaptation area uh, for the poorer countries. That's that's a uh, that's a tall order. We're going to put a lot of money into it. That'll be uh, uh, over the next five years, more than fifty billion dollars. So that's that's uh, that that helps uh, and makes progress in for the poorest countries. That really does have an impact. But we want to find a way to have diagnostics that help say where's the best spots to put that. Where can you save the most lives as people face these uh, these changes of their in their own economies? Um, okay, so I wanted to uh, wanted to get your thoughts on that, but also I'm really interested in what you're feeling from markets from investors as far as uh, how they how they want to think about. Uh, sustainable development or or climate change types in investment are you getting uh, do, do you think there's a, a big sustainable flow into that and what are the boundaries that investors want to put as they think about their investments in these areas in the last two years we've seen hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars moving into sustainable strategies and as, as we have better disclosures by companies it's, it's going to be much easier to execute but what we are seeing, and this is one of the big issues that corporations are feeling right now, uh, more and more money is moving into non, I would say, traditional indexes like the S&P or the MSCI Global Index uh, or whatever liability you're looking at. More and more money is moving into more sustainable strategies. And more importantly, as you get more and more data from each company, you're going to be able to try to see how each company is navigating, how each you know, companies moving in in a, in their in their own footprint. Um, we're going to be able to customize investments for more and more organizations. And and what we are seeing a constant question by public pension funds worldwide, sovereign wealth funds, um, family offices, individual investors across the board. One of the most if you look at where the net new flows are going in 2020 and 2021, more and more money is moving to sustainable investments and sustainable strategies. Um, and, and so um, as money is being redistributed, that, that is a tectonic shift. That is a change um, in asset allocation. And that's going to change valuations of companies, if you're not moving fast enough, if you're not part of those customized investment strategies. Um, and we're already beginning to see that. And quite frankly, as I, I said, more and more business leaders and their boards are starting to recognize if they're not moving fast enough, they're, they're going to be, they're going to have capital outflow in their shares versus other companies in their own industry. Uh, and this is only beginning. I think the existential risk of COVID and we saw the impact of human health. And as we're witnessing now in India, 
this high death rate in India and the high infection rate. And no one has really talked about the impairment of so many people's lungs because of pollution. And why we are seeing a higher death rate is, is a function of what we are seeing in terms of hydrocarbons in the air and the pollution. And, 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 and so that existential risk and the higher degrees of what we're witnessing of climate calamities in various parts of the world, droughts and floods, um, we, are, we are now, there are more and more people raising that question, you know, about the existential risk of the Earth's health and how do, do we have to move faster? And I think this is one of the things that was a surprise to me, David. COVID accelerated client interest in climate and climate risk. COVID has changed the whole concept, should we be moving faster? And that's one of the things that we are seeing. And this is, you know, David, you've been a student of finance for years and years, your whole career, as I have. We always know when people understand a future risk, the present, we bring that risk forward and present value of that risk. And that is what's going on in finance now. We are beginning to price in the impact of climate risk. And you're, we're seeing that every day now. This is one thing people are not understanding, but it's happening across the board now. If you ask a homeowner in Florida right now to name you know, something that I'm, I'm close to, um, property homeowners insurance has gone up as much as 18% a year, year after year, because the reinsurance cost to the insurance companies are going up. Climate risk is having a real impact. I know of many insurance companies have pulled out of insuring in parts of California because of fire risk. If you studied crop insurance, 10 years ago, the state of Iowa was the number one state for the production of corn. And because of flooding and rising temperatures, corn can't tolerate rising temperatures, it is no longer the number one state for corn, but it's the Dakotas north of it. So we are seeing evidence right now in everything we are doing related to how climate risk is becoming investment risk. And we are beginning to see this reallocation of capital. The one area where we've seen so much capital that is moving into it is solar and wind. If you look at the cap rates of what we are investing in for solar and wind, they're down, you know, 800 basis points in, in, in the last few years. What te- and, and now, I mean, the returns on investing in, in, in the developed world for solar and wind is, you know, very tight to treasuries. It's almost the same experience I saw in my early years when we started the mortgage-backed securities market when mortgages were 500 over treasuries, and now they're about 100. You're seeing this reallocation of capital. And that's, that, that is... That just tells me there is more capital that's willing to put money to work in renewables, in decarbonization, than there are available projects. And this is one thing that I'm, I've told this to the Biden administration. I'm telling this to the you know to anybody who will listen to me. Show us the projects, and you know, and there is capital to be put to work. Now, obviously, in the emerging world. This is something where the World Bank, the IMF, private capital can play a big role together. And this is one thing that I would urge. We all come together and find ways of using both private capital and the strength of the World Bank or the IMF in terms of trying to find ways of creating these public-private opportunities. Yeah, we're we're looking for the, these in ways that really maximize the the uh, the combination, the integration of climate and development in ways that will work for for people as they make these uh, these transitions. You know, one thing I'll I, I'll say, and I know we're we're almost out of time. The uh, uh, as you were mentioning several things in my mind, I came back to the subsidies issue. As you think about corn, the corn prices are up. Uh, ethanol is still a big use of corn. 
And you can wonder, uh, is that a maximizing kind of equation? Uh, same is true, uh, I, I've seen in the news, the Bitcoin uses huge amounts of electricity. Uh, and sometimes electricity that's that's really carbon intensive to produce. And so that raises a question of, are subsidies are are the are the subsidies aligned and renewables as as we're uh, oftentimes are are benefiting from uh, from sizable subsidies that uh, that affect that market. So I think one of the challenges for different countries is to is to recognize that their incentive structures are aligned in very different ways. You know, we're totally one great. thing the World Bank doing now in our in our uh, in our uh, climate change action plan is aligning World Bank financing uh, with the Paris uh, with the Paris alignment uh, and that gets into its own set of challenges because countries have such dramatically different NDCs the national the nationally determined contributions what how they're interacting with the Paris agreement so one of the struggles uh, that we have is there's a uh, a tremendous amount of, of uh, detail, but it's really economically large size uh, details that need to still need to be worked on as markets create these structures of the future. Uh, I want to thank you immensely, Larry. Any, uh, any, is there something you wish a government around the world or a governmental body would do that it's not doing now? That can be our our, our concluding uh, topic. To your thoughts. I just said it, but I really, there is so much available capital to be invested. And I would urge all governments and uh, to be finding solutions that encompasses both public and private. I don't believe now in terms of infrastructure or in terms of the, the you know, we, we almost have to relook at how we finance. Um, and in the United States, we're so accustomed to municipal finance. Um, you know, the World Bank is accustomed to doing most of the financing itself. There are opportunities working with the public and private to get today. And, uh, you know, I go back to my foundation of mortgage-backed securities. Um, you know, that has been an incredibly successful program uh, to get more and more Americans to, um, uh, to own, to, with home ownership. Um, and, um, and it really costs very little money. I mean, uh, over over normalized times, and even if you now look back at the cost of rehabilitating Fannie and Freddie, now the, the dividends it's paying back, it's 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 it that has all all the problems back when it was probably not properly managed. Um, it, it's been a great uh, outcome for for the United States, and I would I would urge the opportunity of creating this you know the same type of senior subordinated type of opportunities. The capital is there, um, but you know as we all know um, the circumstances around some of the emerging world is capital is not there because of the fear of political risk, the fear of what role do you have as a, you know, as a U.S. investor, as a pension fund? You know, the difference today is, you know, especially in the emerging world uh, investing, back in the 1980s when banks' balance sheets invested in the emerging world, that was one thing. Today, when, when BlackRock is investing in the emerging world, we're investing pension fund assets. We're not, it's, and we're not the asset owner. We're, we're, we're a fiduciary. And that, I, I would say that is a story that needs to really get out, too, and how, you know, there's huge pools of capital, but it's a different type of capital than a bank's balance sheet. It is capital that we're investing on in behalf of pension funds and all that. Now, the positive side is um, we, have, we have the ability to invest out 30 years, you know, if that's appropriate. Because, you know, two thirds of our assets we manage, of the $9 trillion we manage, our pension fund assets, so they're long, long liabilities. And so the opportunity to be working together can be enormous. Um, and so I, this is another part of my optimism that if we all sit down and find an opportunity and a solution, the, the capital is there, the opportunities could become really large and, and, and we could get to this net zero world if we, we all work together and, uh, with long-term solutions.
That's a really optimistic uh, 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 close. That there is long-term patient capital available, and so then if yeah. we can, if the if, if incentive structures can be aligned uh, and make sense, yeah. then the, the, there's funding available. Well, thank you very much, uh, Larry Fink, for uh, for for helping us kick off this conference. Really, very much appreciated. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to do this with you. So, so thank you. Well, thank you very much to David Malpass and Larry Fink for that very interesting discussion. It is really very useful to have them set the tone for the conversation now and over the next three days. They've challenged us to think about results and the measurable impact of climate policies on how they affect communities and how we must bring them along in the low carbon transition and on how the public and private sector can work together to tackle one of the defining challenges of our time. I now have the honor of welcoming Teresa Ribera, Spain's fourth vice president of the government and minister for ecological transition and demographic challenge, to join me for a fireside chat as we discuss what it's going to take to unlock investments for climate action. Madam Vice President, very warm welcome to you. Um, may we start by talking about climate action frameworks? Because in this regard, Spain hasn't just been talking the talk, has it? You've been walking the walk. Hello. Yes, we have been trying to 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 walk uh, the, the talk, as you say, and doing different things in different fields of action. So we wanted to count on a strategic framework that could provide some clarity on where we want to be and how we plan to, to reach that point facilitating some tools, some instruments to be sure that we can assess, accelerate, or uh, make the, 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 the small changes that may be needed along the years. And uh, we want this to happen in a very generalized manner. We have been building a strategic framework for climate and energy, introducing very important regulatory reforms to the energy field, introducing this uh, need to assess what climate impacts mean for our economy, our infrastructure, and our natural resources, and how we can go along these years in a way that the transitional costs do not lay on the, um, the families, the households, but um, that the industry is also in a position to make this transformation as a positive experience of trying to, to come along um, with the different players. We've got the okay. law. We've got uh, the national energy and climate goals for 2030, the long-term strategy to finalize the decarbonization of our whole economy by 2050 at the latest, and relevant uh, transformational challenges in the context of the national adaptation plan and uh, the green finance strategy. So we want to use all the recovery resources to facilitate this transformation and the just transition plans to be sure that the workers and the local communities being affected by the phase out of the coal do not suffer from this transformation but can build on right. new opportunities. Now you've approved a climate change law that sets the country on a path to achieving net zero by 2050. How is that going to channel investment into sustainable industries? That's what we aim to do. We think that it is very important to provide comfort and uh, visibility on how, when, and which, in which fields uh, we can assure that uh, all the things go along with these uh, decarbonization goals, providing some uh, guidelines on the timeframes for each of the sectors and providing some uh, guidance on how we want to achieve these goals and how we can facilitate this. Uh, the law provides some of these elements together with the capacity to review some instrumental elements um, and tools that can help into this transformation. So the transparency uh, in the rated uh, companies and the financial sector, the capacity to orientate the fiscal reforms towards something that makes sense and provide the right signals, also in terms of cost and uh, benefits from investing in, in climate compatible a, um, in the climate compatible economy and the capacity to take uh, a full advantage of some of the credible uh, principles such as the interdiction of the backtracking in terms of climate goals, the capacity to know uh, 
that we will not uh, accept any additional permits to explore on hydrocarbons, for instance, or the limitations uh, to, uh, to, 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 to these fossil fuel new investments, together with some um, additional obligations to facilitate the electrification, the energy efficiency, and the re renewable energy investments um, all along the, uh, the, the country land. Well, there's policy. And then there's the people, and you don't need me to tell you this, you are a former politician yourself. For those nations weighing up the situation, what do you see as the expected social and economic benefits of passing such a law, and how do you convince the voters? I think this is a very important issue. I think that it is very important that anyone can experience the benefits of investing in climate action and can feel that um, the institutions do not forget about the transactional cost of this transformation. This is why we insist very much on the social aspects of the transition towards a new energy model. This is why we have insisted on the just transition strategies in all the places where the coal is going, is being phased out, or the strategies on energy poverty, because it's true that sometimes the, um, the reference to, to the carbon cost in the price of the energy uh, may impact in a very different manner in terms of what does this represent in the share of the incomes of households. So we need to come along with the industry and we need to come along with the with the families to cover this, uh, these risks. Then I think that it is important to work with the young people and to work with the most innovative approaches also in the industrial sector. And um, this is why it is very important to have uh, an open mind to, to get all the innovation proposals, innovative proposals coming from the private sector, but also coming from the citizenship. So how we can ensure that through these um, new forms of participation, the assemblies of citizens, the capacity to, to take advantage of the cooperation between the different administrations or the partnerships with private uh, entrepreneurs uh, may help to identify the risk, but also to, to Build on the opportunities, and um, I think that this is uh, a work that is uh, quite uh, intense in the use of political energy. But it is absolutely a must if we want to succeed. It is too much change in too short time. So we need to be sure that the conversation takes place with no noise and um, and in a fruitful in a fruitful manner. Of course, one hand can't clap alone, though, can it? And I know you've expressed frustration over the slow reform of the Energy Charter Treaty, which would bring it in line with the Paris Agreement. So tell me, how pivotal is it to remove investment protection for fossil fuels? I think this is a very critical element. For a very long time, we thought about the globalisation as something which was positive on its own, and we thought that the promotion of the trade and the uh, investments abroad was important and good on its own. And we forgot about um, the, the features of what we were doing and um, how this can impact in the macroeconomics, sorry, in the microeconomics, and how it can impact in the distributional effects or in the need of transformation. This is why I think that in the context of the review of the Energy Charter, Charter Treaty, it is very important to explore how we can use these tools in order to facilitate the transportation towards something which is different. How we can build a toolkit to facilitate the energy transition everywhere instead of freezing what we already know that um, is not worthy anymore. So we need to facilitate a phase out of what it terms um, and to facilitate the phasing of what we need. And um, this is something that uh, raises different questions around the, 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 the concrete breathing, the concrete um, elements of the energy uh, charter treaty mm. as it is right now. Well, this sort of dovetails very nicely into the point you've just made. How can developing countries with large, vulnerable communities be better supported? I think this is very important and very interesting. And to, for many reasons, we need to combine and to connect the different dots um, between development, investment, prosperity, and peace and security. I think that uh, we need to work in a, in a context where providing the right signals is important. So what type of development we are talking about? And when we talk about development, we are talking about energy infrastructures, urban development, mobility, water, access to water and sanitation, uh, food security. So many things that um, do connect to the climate action. 
Uh, so the first question is, what about the public institutions and the development banks mainstreaming this type of considerations when talking about financing development? Then there are additional things which are important. How we can provide the right signals to the private investments to do things in the right direction and uh, how we can ensure that we invest in a proper adaptation and resilience uh, building exercise. At the end, it's a kind of um, insurance. We cannot um, expect uh, the, the, the returns uh, in our investments if we are building in, in, in a place where uh, the adaptation, the resilience to the climate impacts is not being taken into consideration. So I think that we need okay. to build in, at the same time in how far we can arrive uh, in order to provide a low carbon and climate resilient development and how we can ensure that the conditions are there to, to, to be sure that the impacts do not have a significant harm in the people and in our investments. The, develop, the role of the development banks, the role of transparency, so learning to measure what type of risk and what type of opportunities we may have as investors. The role of the green finance, including for the public institutions, so green debt as something which is important in order to facilitate the proper uh, security in our public investments. The role of the institutions as prescriptors, so how the public procurement can help to provide the right signals, how the uh, taxonomy can help in order to decide and to provide a context for proper investments is absolutely key. And then, of course, the solidarity. I think that uh, even under those circumstances, we still need to ensure to facilitate a proper financial flow in terms of solidarity, because we know that the challenge to ensure climate resilience um, in some countries, in some communities, is much higher than in others. So we need to facilitate these um, this, uh, right. financial flows coming from public budgets. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Vice President, for sharing those thoughts with us. Over the coming days, we're going to hear a lot about climate solutions that are already taking shape around the world, in countries at various stages of development. We wanted to hear directly from policymakers. If they could choose one scalable solution to prioritise, what would it be? Here's what Camille Robinson-Regis, Minister of Planning and Development in Trinidad and Tobago, and Jean d'Arc Mujawamera, Rwanda's Minister of Environment, had to say. Interestingly, like other small island developing states, technical, technological, financial, institutional, and human resource capacity challenges are part of the challenges for the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Also, the fact that we are an oil and gas uh, economy has in fact created some challenges for us as we move towards achieving our goals. But we are amongst the first to establish a measurement, reporting and verification system for greenhouse gas emissions. And we are pursuing steps to incorporate mandatory emissions reporting into law that will allow us to achieve our NDCs as well as identify options for further mitigation as we move along this path. We have instituted at the cost of the state an ambitious fuel switching program in the transportation sector by utilizing our natural gas in order to ensure that the population understands that for vehicular at emissions, even whilst we recognize that natural gas as a transportation fuel is a transition fuel as we strive for sustainable emissions free of uh, negative emissions. So our movement is to renewable energy, even in the transportation sector. We are in the process of formulating various policy approaches, such as the development of the just transition of the workforce policy to guide the labor sector in the transition to a low carbon economy, as well as an e-mobility policy to allow for the greater participation of electric vehicles. We are finalizing arrangements for the investment 
for the largest solar generation utility scale plant in the Caribbean with a production capacity of over 112 megawatts with ambition to increase this capacity in the future. Our objective, therefore, is to ensure that as we move along this path, we take the population with us as they are full in their understanding that this is the objective of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Greetings from Kigali, Rwanda. Rwanda is blessed with green rolling hills, lush rainforest, white savannas, and crystal clear lakes. This natural heritage is one of our most valuable assets, but hilly topography brings with it a number of challenges. Due to climate change, we are experiencing increased flooding and landslides. To address this, we are working with local communities to relocate people living in high-risk areas and rehabilitate wetlands so that they can play their natural function in flood mitigation and ecosystem services. We have also faced difficulties in financing our ambitious plan to become a carbon neutral and climate resilient economy by the middle of the century. That's why we established the Rwanda Green Fund to act as the engine of green growth and facilitate investment in climate resilience. Since it was created, the fund has mobilized close to $200 million, created more than 140,000 green jobs, protected and rehabilitated more than 30,000 hectares of watersheds and water bodies. Accessing the right technologies to address the climate crisis also remains a challenge. That's why we created the Cleaner Production and Climate Innovation Center to incubate new technologies and upscale them. The center is promoting the sector economy and the green job creation. Rwanda is also one of the best places on the continent for doing business. This facilitates the private investment needed to scale up green growth and climate resilience. I thank you for your kind attention. Really important messages there to think about people and communities and better communication. Also about how climate solutions are interconnected across sectors. My thanks to you both for those insights. Well, we've heard a lot today, haven't we, about how governments in the private sector are driving climate action and the kind of support they need in order to deliver resilient and low carbon solutions at scale. We are going to close today with a panel looking at how global institutions can support countries with green, resilient and inclusive development. I'm honoured to be joined by Dr Ngozi okonjo ewela Director General of the World Trade Organisation. Tao Zhang is with us. Deputy Managing Director at the International Monetary Fund, and Guy Ryder, Director General of the International Labour Organisation. Welcome to Innovate for Climate, all of you, and thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. If I may start with you, Ngozi, please. Currently, only a fifth of global emissions are subject to carbon pricing, but where it does exist, a carbon price has proven to be very effective. You've also written, I know, about how carbon pricing is a real opportunity for all countries, not just advanced economies, also emerging markets and developing countries. What is the WTO's position on the expansion of carbon pricing in order to meet global commitments under the Paris Agreement? Well, thank you so much. Um, well, you know, as you said, I've, I've written and, and I believe that carbon pricing is a very good instrument uh, for uh, countries to use to lower carbon emissions. And certainly we believe the same thing at the, at the WTO. Um, but, you know, the issue is that carbon pricing uh, is very fragmented now in the world. According to the World Bank, only 64 uh, carbon pricing initiatives were implemented or scheduled to be implemented in 2020. And the, the, the pricing is so fragmented from less than a dollar per ton in Ukraine to almost uh, 130 in, in Sweden. And they only cover 
22% of global emissions. So whilst it's a very good instrument, we need to uh, look at uh, how to make it less fragmented. A global carbon price would be wonderful, and certainly we believe in this uh, at the WTO. I've often said to uh, fellow finance ministers, I'm a former finance minister, that this, you can kill two birds with one stone through carbon pricing, lower carbon emissions, and you have another source of revenues as well. Um, so I think the best would be if we could find a way to have a global carbon price, um, that, and this would make things so much easier uh, worldwide. But let me say that we also believe that um, we, we need to look at other ways to realign incentives and financial flows, uh, to maybe towards sectors that um, contribute to climate mitigation and adaptation and help producers, particularly in developing countries, uh, to, to lower carbon emissions. And uh, we need in trade, we've seen that uh, renewables uh, have done very well. We've gone from about uh, $82 billion in 2005 worth of uh, solar panels and products, for example, to $300 billion in 2019 through trade. And so uh, the export, these exports have made it possible for developing countries to really adopt products that lead to lower carbon emissions. So in the WTO, we are very supportive uh, of all these uh, moves and try to encourage them. Well, I mean, let's stay with this idea of, of innovative approaches. Uh, Tao Zhang, uh, just talk me through a little bit of what the IMF is, is taking into its thinking to factor in climate risk, for both for research and also policy advice. Thank you. Uh, as you know, one of our objectives uh, is to uh, integrate the macro-critical uh, issues and the risks of climate into our core uh, operational activities, uh, which uh, ranging from the uh, economic and financial surveillance, policy research and advice, and a capacity development effort, as well as development of solid and uh, consistent uh, macro and uh, climate data. So uh, let me uh, take a few minutes to, to uh, briefly uh, highlight three uh, important aspects of our approach. First, our approach is a comprehensive approach. We believe there is a need uh, for a package of policies to combat climate change, while also uh, fostering uh, the economies and ensuring a just uh, transitions. What is this means? This means uh, carbon pricing, as Ngozi just uh, highlighted. In practice, this uh, could mean uh, to put a big fat price on carbon, as Angel Huria colorfully put it. Um, but carbon pricing uh, has to be uh, complemented with job-rich green investment and with adequate resources to protect vulnerable uh, groups. And second, our approach uh, is a, a multilateral approach. Uh, the IMF supports a pragmatic and equitable international carbon price floor agreed multilaterally with pricing possibly differentiated for countries at different levels of development. Uh, as we see, uh, and we see a key role for climate finance uh, and technology uh, transfers to help developing economies in particular to scale up their adaptations and mitigation effort. And finally, uh, our approach uh, is a inclusive approach. Uh, we need to harness uh, the private sectors and indeed uh, all of society. For example, we're working with our members and partners uh, towards the development of a green taxonomy and standardized the reporting of climate-related financial risks, which could unlock trillions of dollars in private financing. That's very important. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Guy Ryder, just picking up, um, just on the scale and speed of change, as countries are shifting towards more low-carbon industries and sectors, it is critical to ensure that no one is left behind, particularly those communities I'm thinking of that powered our homes and economies in the past. So what are some of the best practices that we're seeing and 
How can those communities who did power the world before be helped to transition justly? Very much the question that I think uh, we need to bring into the conversation and building on what my colleagues have already said, uh, I think we're seeing good practices emerging. And I think that the, the good practices at the, the national level are those that bring together three ingredients. Firstly, you need that ingredient of political will, not just of governments, but of society in general, expressed through the national, nationally determined contributions uh, to the Paris uh, Agreement goals. So you need those objectives and those goals. And then you need to bring two more things to the show. One is finance. We have to invest in this transition. Uh, and that, of course, is something where the international community has a shared responsibility. And the third piece, and it's perhaps where I can add something more to the conversation, is the labor market engineering, as I call it. Uh, what we have to do to the way people work, where they work, what alternatives of work they may have to ensure, as you have said, people don't get left behind and we do have this just transition. This will not happen automatically. Now, our organization has pointed out that by 2030, uh, if we apply uh, the Paris Agreement objectives in the right way, we can have a major employment dividend, uh, 24 million jobs created, okay, 6 million eliminated, but there is a balance. But these are aggregates, and people don't live in an aggregate world. People live in the individual world of jobs, communities, families, location. And that's where we have to make sure that country by country, we have comprehensive public uh, programs for just transition. And we're seeing them emerge more and more, and it's very encouraging, which are, as my uh, colleague has said, inclusive. And in the world of work, that means bringing governments together with workers and employers, and we work through things together, bringing together these three elements, ambition, political ambition, labor market know-how, and the investment finance that we need to make it all go. And this is happening. Right. Uh, and just to come back, I mean, what are you know, the best practices that you have seen, and, and what can we learn from them? Well, I can give quite a lot of examples, but let me take an example of Spain, uh, for example, where they you know, basically phased out a coal industry, quite centralised in one part of the country, in Asturias, but through a process of careful planning and investment and inclusive dialogue with the unions concerned and local communities, they found a way forward. Uh, we know that there is a climate change law pending in the Congress in Spain, uh, and it's moving forward in a very, very impressive way. I could, right. I could point to uh, other um, hydrocarbon intensive industries, Alberta and other countries, but are there these ingredients sure. coming together? Uh, well, I mean, that, that's a, a very good example. And Gozi, if we can just sort of widen our perspective a little bit to resilience and, and building strategies, just as a concept. A number of jurisdictions are considering carbon border adjustments. So what do you think are the key considerations, or, or maybe, you know, you want to take it this way, the biggest challenges to help promote compatibility with WTO rules? Well, thank, thank you so much. Uh, maybe I can make a, a three or four points on, on this issue. I think, first of all, let me just say that, um, you know, um, environmental taxes per se have been a common feature of, of international trade and, and, you know, under WTO rules, uh, they can work. If you charge internal taxes on, on products uh, in, inside the border, uh, you, you can adjust them uh, at the border with products like products that are coming in. And this, this um, is being done. Uh, but carbon border adjustments, um, I, I think, um, are much more a complicated mechanism. And right now, the WTO, we're looking at the legal, uh, technical, and implementation aspects of this. And I think a lot will depend on the design as to whether it will be compatible with our rules or not. Uh, you know, it must be non-discriminatory. Uh, it must be fair, transparent, you know, able, uh, e easy to monitor uh, and, and measure. And these are some of the uh, challenges that may be encountered. Uh, uh, with a carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism. That being said, perhaps, uh, you know, there are sectors, one could start from a sectoral perspective with industries like steel, cement, uh, and, and, and so on. 
But what I would like to say is that, look, uh, in spite of these difficulties, uh, we are quite prepared to work with governments to look for ways to implement mechanisms that will help lower carbon emissions uh, through the trade mechanism. Uh, and we should not, governments should not use WTO rules as an excuse not to find a way to implement uh, the, the uh, environmental taxes. We will see as we complete our study how this uh, uh, works with the WTO rules. But one thing I'd like to say, as I said in the earlier comment on, on carbon prices, a fragmented approach to this might be problematic. And some of our members are already uh, pointing that out. And let me also say that developing country members of the WTO are also looking at how they will have the capacity to follow and implement some of these. So there, there are some, some challenges in, in front of us, but I, I repeat that um, members, we can work with members to find ways uh, through trade uh, to be able to help contribute to and lower carbon emissions. And let me just say finally that, uh, look, WTO members uh, are working really hard in several areas. You know, we have an environmental uh, goods and services uh, agreement that was being negotiated uh, since 2016. I hope we can revive that because that would be a big contribution. There are members who have got together to work on issues like plastics, which will also help. So altogether, there's a great deal of excitement among WTO members as to how we can contribute and how trade and contribute to lowering carbon emissions. Okay, um, Tao Zhang, just turning to you, it, it is becoming more and more clear that natural disasters are on the rise and the poorest countries are getting hit the hardest. And this goes far beyond the immediate loss of things like life, livelihoods and property. It has a long-term economic effect too. So how is the IMF supporting resilience building strategies in, in climate vulnerable countries? That's right. Um, Thank you for this very important questions. Uh, we really need to uh, step up our uh, support to uh, this uh, uh, climate vulnerable countries. Um, as we know, uh, many uh, climate vulnerable countries are uh, also uh, smallest or uh, poorest uh, among our memberships. Um, for these countries, uh, there's really no time to lose uh, in building uh, resilience uh, to natural disasters and other climate-related uh, uh, impact. Um, so speaking of our contributions, uh, our contributions are uh, threefold. Uh, threefold. Uh, first, uh, we uh, provide capacity development support. And here, uh, our focus is to help climate vulnerable countries uh, integrate uh, climate risks uh, into their uh, macroeconomic and uh, fiscal uh, frameworks. Uh, one example uh, is our joint uh, pilot programs uh, with uh, the World Bank. Uh, we call it the, uh, the Climate Change Policy Assessment. Uh, the program uh, analyzes the uh, uh, preparedness, uh, assesses uh, mitigations and uh, adaptation policies, and quantifies uh, financing needs. Uh, in that regard, uh, uh, try to serve uh, as a framework to uh, help unlock uh, donor support and, and, and government resources as well. Other examples, of course, include uh, uh, technical assistance project on uh, environmental uh, tax reforms, uh, carbon and energy pricing, and public financial management, etc. cetera. Um, second, um, we contribute to the resilience buildings through our lending operations as well. Um, we have emergency facilities uh, that countries can use when they face large uh, uh, natural disasters, shocks. Um, and last year, of course, in the face of the pandemic, uh, a full 45 low income and developing countries received uh, our financial support already. Finally, um, we consistently uh, advocate uh, climate finance and technology transfers to uh, developing and emerging uh, economies. Uh, the international community must live up to uh, its commitment of $100 billion annually in climate finance. 
we are also, of course, uh, together with the World Bank and other development partners, uh, exploring uh, complementary uh, mechanism, uh, including, uh, for example, the uh, debt for climate uh, swaps. That's where uh, right. actually uh, actively working on. Thank you. No, no, you're you're very welcome. Um, I mean, with the best will in the world, states, sectors corporations can have the will, but the way must be found through the workforce. So, Guy, if I can turn to you on this. How do we better educate the current and future workforce to equip people with the skills that they are going to need as part of this low-carbon, resilient transition that we've been hearing about? And what approaches do you think have been particularly successful in helping support these kind of changes? We, um, we negotiated between governments, employers and workers at the global level a set of guidelines on what it takes to make just transitions happen. And it goes directly to the question uh, that you're asking. And I can, again, put three things into the, uh, into the equation, which I think we have to pay attention to. The very first one is the one that you have mentioned, skills and training. Uh, it is quite clear that the skill requirements uh, in a future world of work, which is carbon neutral, are going to be significantly different from the ones required to do jobs uh, today. And so we are engaging with our member states to do uh, assessment of skills needs in the future. We're doing this at the global level, particular um, focus on Africa with our friends from the African uh, Development Bank. And the necessary counterpart of that work on skills needs assessment is an assessment of the current training and educational capacities that country have, countries have so that we can make uh, the right type of uh, remedial uh, action. Then we have, and I think it's very important to emphasize this, we have to emphasize um, the need to step up uh, social protection provision because there is no sense, in my view at least, in understating the degree of world of work disruption that this transition uh, uh, is going to bring. We shouldn't understate that. And the way we have to, I think, present this is by saying, we will be helping people through that disruption and social protection is the key to helping people through it. And uh, you know, if there's one lesson from this pandemic that we could bring to this conversation, it is that where social protection uh, is falling short, we're going to run into problems, we're going to run into obstacles. And the last piece of the equation, and I've made reference to it in my first uh, intervention, is social dialogue. This need to involve people to work out solutions. It's important to legitimacy, it's important to the acceptability of processes. But it's also important because those who are doing the work know a lot that other people do not know. There is know-how available in dialogue. And we're seeing some very impressive processes getting underway. The German Coal Commission is one example. South Africa's national planning processes is another. Uh, this is the way forward, and we're trying to um, back our member states in all of these dimensions. Thank you very much, Ngozi, Tao and Guy. Now, before we wrap up today, we have one final message from a young climate champion. Around the world, every day, young champions are pushing for bold climate action from governments, businesses and communities. We asked Sophia Babera, an ambassador for the Global Youth Climate Network, to share with us her thoughts on how climate action connects with gender equality and why it's important to tackle both together. Hi everyone, my name is Sofia Berbeiro, based in Lisbon, Portugal, and today I bring you the interrelationship between gender equality and climate action. So how successful would you deem um, a solution or would you consider a climate solution if it was designed by those least affected by climate change? Would you deem it fitting? Across societies, girls and women continue to be excluded from participatory and decision-making roles, and this is by default. Especially in developing countries, social cultural norms disregard their capability to bring solutions to the table and fail to incorporate women-led initiatives in climate response plans. Ironically, though, women are disproportionately affected by climate change as they make up, up to 80% of people displaced by natural disasters and are more likely to experience poverty. So what can be done to accelerate change 
and tackle two of today's biggest global challenges we face. The Gender Action Plan by UNFCCC recognizes that women cannot be left voiceless if we are to succeed in effective climate action. So I bring you here today some examples of what can be done. We can highlight solutions designed by local communities and indigenous women to enhance their effective participation in climate policy and action. We can promote, protect and preserve local indigenous and traditional knowledge and practices across sectors for environmental and biodiversity protection. We can foster women's full participation and leadership in science, technology and research for building diverse gender responsive solutions and improve climate resilience. We can also implement national climate policies to deploy their technological solutions to address climate change. We can also implement national climate policies that are gender responsive and contribute to women empowerment. And finally, we can facilitate women's access, access to funding to deploy their technological solutions to address climate change. In brief, our efforts to ensure environmental protection, biodiversity conservation for climate action will be as successful as the number of indigenous and women-led initiatives we implement. Or simply put, by advancing gender equality, we are one step closer to solving the climate crisis that we currently face. Thank you. On that hopeful note, we end our plenary. I really hope you've enjoyed our opening session of day one. Do visit the agenda for details on the workshops that are due to commence very shortly and make sure you sign up for the ones that you'd really like to attend if you haven't done so already. And remember, keep joining in the discussion. We really want to hear from you. I'll be back tomorrow and I look forward to seeing you then. Goodbye.